the top 10 strongest monsters in One Punch Man. The monsters in One Punch Man are also called mysterious beings, some of which are edible, but that's another topic for another video. The Japanese term used for mostly creatures on this list is kaiju, but some fall under a different category, kaijin, like Garo, who, spoiler alert, we will be talking about later on. Most of the monsters we'll be discussing on this list are dragon level and possibly even higher, as a few strays haven't accurately been classified as of yet due to the series still keeping their abilities a secret. Think of characters like Mad Cyborg, who we know very little about. Let's describe these monsters first though. The term monster is kind of vague in One Punch Man considering some characters use monsterization cells like Goketsu who isn't included in this list because he was killed off screen. Then there's humans like Marugori whose brother Fukegao gave him unimaginable strength through science. And there are even people who transform through stranger means like Crablante who is level tiger who according to him ate too much crab and was monsterized afterwards. And you know what by that logic I should be a monster too. But of course there are also more traditional kinds of monsters like Vaccine Man, who is created through the environment and doesn't really have a human background. For each of these types, there will be inclusions on the list, and you would be surprised to see which types rank the highest. But how do we classify a monster's strength in a series where everyone, especially the protagonist, is overpowered? Well, since Saitama is the main character, we're going to judge by how long these monsters could or have survived against One Punch Man himself. And keep in mind that these will strictly be monsters we have seen so far in the manga. But before we go any further, this video is sponsored by Sakurako and Tokyo. Treat, the best Japanese snack subscriptions available. With a subscription to Tokyo Treat, you'll get access to up to 20 of the latest and greatest limited edition seasonal Japanese snacks available. Meanwhile, with Sakurako, you can enjoy 20 traditional and authentic artesian Japanese snacks, including teas and one special Japanese tableware item each month. Sakurako partners with local Japanese snack makers to continue sharing Japanese culture and traditions that have been passed down for centuries. The theme of this month's Tokyo Treat box is snacking in Shibuya, which is filled to the brim with exclusive pop culture snacks from all over downtown Tokyo. So far, my favorite thing would have to be the lemon taiyaki, but the caramel popcorn soda really surprised me with how good it is and how accurate it is to the food. The theme for this month's Sakurako box is Taste of Hokkaido. Inside are several fresh and authentic Hokkaido teas and delights. And I would honestly order this box for this shrimp snack alone. It is incredible. If you want to try these out for yourselves, you can use code PLOTARMOR to save $5 off your first Sakurako or Tokyo Treat box. And if you order by May 31st, you can get the same boxes that we did. Thanks again to Sakurako and Tokyo True for the awesome snacks, but now back to the topic at hand. If you've already seen our top 10 heroes video, then you should already be subscribed to the channel with notifications on, but if you aren't, this is your time to do so. Number 10, Vampire Pure Blood. This may be surprising to some people who have only seen the anime, but though some monsters are classified as demon or dragon, they're not all equal in terms of power levels and often can be interchanged. A good example of this is Vampire, as he likely wasn't known to the Hero Association until the monsters started a raid on the surface and gave him a ranking based on the damage they witnessed. This isn't to say this pure blood being belongs higher than at number 10, but let's get into why that is. Vampire was, at the minimum, classified as a demon level monster, but was certainly stronger than the likes of Armor Gorilla. Beast King, and Mosquito Girl the latter of the two whom Saitama was able to one-punch without any special moves. His ranking wasn't clear as Hero Association mentioned monsters appearing that were demon or higher, not indicating which of the many were higher leveled. For the sake of this video, we are going to consider Vampire as a dragon level threat because of the S-Class hero he went up against and the amount of hatred he got from his fellow mysterious beings. Not only was Vampire a monster by birth and not from evolution, monster cells, or experiments, he came from a lineage of vampires. Some of his abilities were regeneration, especially with the help of blood and sucking the light from whoever was around him, transformation into a swarm of bats, the manifestation of steel wings that could both cut through his opponents and help him fly, and the usual enhanced speed, strength, and reflexes seen in other monsters. He also had razor-sharp teeth, claws, and a short fuse. One of his greatest feats was the attack on V-City, where he was able to kill a large number of people, even being surprised by how weak humans turned out to be. But the exact number of victims was undisclosed. Unfortunately, a lot of details were missing in regards to Vampire, even during his confrontation with Zombie Man, which we'll get into shortly. A team of S-Class heroes were sent to face the growing threat that the Monster Association posed, as well as to retake Narinki's kidnapped son, as he is one of the top sponsors for the Hero Association. During this time, Zombie Man ran into a number of low-level monsters whom, instead of attacking him, escorted him to the dark room where Vampire waited for his next opponent. Vampire was shown hanging on the ceiling, his wings wrapped tightly around him. The battle began abruptly, with Vampire biting into Zombie Man's neck before his bullets could even reach him. Unfortunately for pure blood, Zombie Man's blood wasn't the usual monster or human blood, but something disgusting that he didn't want to use to replenish himself. 
Although greatly underestimating Zombie Man, Vampire did perform amazing tricks such as catching all of his bullets and launching them back, moving so fast as to land on Zombie Man's blades, and getting a hole the size of a football shot through him and still regenerating. This was made easier by the monsters nearby cheering the fight on, supplying Vampire with all the blood he needed to heal himself. After a 30 minute long fight, which is a very very long time that takes a whole lot of stamina that we don't see, and lethally injuring Zombie Man no less than 200 times, Vampire succumbed to his injuries and could no longer heal himself. As Vampire required a constant source of blood and life from beings around him to regenerate his body, it was inevitable that he would eventually run out and lose. This was his biggest weakness. However, had he been pitted against someone who wasn't in the top 10 of S-Class heroes like Pity Pity Prisoner or Tank Top Master, or even Super Alloy Darkshine who becomes weak when he's not sure to win, maybe Vampire could have survived just a bit longer. Homeless Emperor, one of the top executives and also included in this list, cannot put Zombie Man down either. And it's unknown whether someone as powerful as Saitama could damage Zombie Man to the point of not being able to regenerate, so it was over for Vampire as soon as Zombie Man arrived. R.I.P. to his lineage, although, imagine if Vampire had drank some of Saitama's blood. Whoa. Number 9. Elder Centipede Not to be confused with Junior and Senior Centipede. Next on the list we have the mysterious being who fought a number of S-Class heroes, including Blast. This dragon level threat was also classified at times as a natural disaster due to the amount of damage left in his wake. Let's dive into Elder Centipede's strengths first. With high survivability, this monster easily fought Metal Bat who stood no chance against the sheer size of his body and barely took any damage from him. Elder Centipede also had the power to regenerate himself through molting as seen when he fought Genos, Bang, and Bomb. Elder Centipede's body was developed to the point of even surviving an internal explosion from Genos, who used Ultra Spiral Incineration Cannon on him. But if that wasn't enough, his stomach acid was able to melt Genos down to his robot skeleton, making him unable to avoid incoming attacks. Needless to say, Elder Centipede's size alone could cause immense destruction to any city he would pass through. He was also used as a form of transportation underground for smaller monsters. But Elder Centipede's greatest achievement was somehow facing Blast and getting away from the mysterious number one hero. Not only had he survived the battle, but he reappeared two years later without any scars or damage to speak of. Were his molting abilities so strong that any evidence of his loss disappeared over time? That is another unanswered question of this series. For all these achievements, Elder Centipede was no match for Saitama when he showed up. I can't say Elder Centipede had a glaring flaw to speak of, besides the fact that he was obsessed with getting revenge for his previous loss against Blast. If he hadn't fallen for King's taunting, could he have survived long enough to meet his fated foe? Highly unlikely. He was unlucky enough to come across Saitama, who is easily on par with and likely surpasses Blast. In the anime, this battle is a bit misleading as it shows Saitama simply punching him with no special move name, though depicting a wind-up and his serious expression. In the manga, it is explicitly stated that Saitama uses a serious punch, not just his normal punches that he used on lower level monsters. Additionally, this was after Saitama had pent up frustration from playing video games with King, so perhaps his punch was even stronger than the other serious ones that we've seen in the past. It's honestly pretty hard to differentiate when the premise of a story is how overpowered the main character is. But let's move on to the next spot on our list. Number 8. Overgrown Rover aka Poochie This dog looking monster is categorized as a dragon level threat and was the security guard for the Monster Association and one of their top leaders. The past tense usage in this case does not mean Rover is dead, but that'll be explained later. Rover uses concentrated heat blasts or energy balls as Aitama also describes as fire when he faces this massive blast. Not only that, but Rover can create shockwaves from the attacks that seem like massive earthquakes underground. In spite of his huge body, Rover has the stealth of a ninja, sneaky enough to come across Garo and Tadeo without making a sound. This giant doggo also has enhanced strength, speed, and resilience to outside attacks, as seen by his survival of Saitama's punch when he faces him in the tunnels. With Rover's heat blast aimed for Garo, he was able to completely disintegrate the two demon level monsters that happened to be in the way of his attack. And if that wasn't enough, Rover can also change the trajectory of his blasts if needed. Speaking of, let's talk Talk about his battle with Garo for a bit now. As mentioned, Garo was trying to protect Tadeo and did not want to face Rover. I repeat, the hero hunter himself, who loves facing strong opponents, did not want to go against Rover because he knew it would be more than he could handle from his instincts warning him. Not only that, but the fear is clearly visible in Garo's face, something we had hardly seen up until this point. However, Garo had no choice but to face him when he wanted to give Tadeo enough time to run away and a battle ensued. Rover used his powerful blast against Garo, severely injuring him with the multiple attacks. And when Garo countered with a direct hit of his own, Rover shook it off as if he had been tickled a bit, launching a point 
blank concentrated blast at Garo and sending him crashing through many of the floors. I would certainly consider Rover the winner of this battle. The Rover, good at his guard dog duties, did not cower away from facing Saitama, who appeared next in front of him. He immediately attacked when Saitama asked about monsters nearby. But Rover's massive blast was dodged and he was sent flying with one of Saitama's untitled punches, causing immense reverberations throughout the Monster Association. Coincidentally, Saitama said sit pooch, the same as Garo had, but the end result was vastly different. After facing Saitama though, arguably the strongest man in the series, Rover still survived. Then Du S needed his help facing Bang, Bomb, and Fubuki, so she whistled for him. He came right away, attacking the heroes with his concentrated blast and forcing them to flee with the captives. His blasts were so numerous that even Bang couldn't hide his surprise at the onslaught. With Rover overwhelming them and nowhere near being spent in terms of energy, it seemed like a desperate situation for the trio. Even with them combining their efforts and relying on Fubuki's psychic powers. What made Rover lose then you ask? Well this also leads us to Rover's weakness. With Saitama having ingrained the sick command through a deep-seated fear, Rover can no longer ignore the command. As soon as Bang said it, only half serious and mostly to himself, Rover sat down and obeyed. Rover had been trained through Saitama's powerful punch and the memory of its effects on him. Previously, Rover's masters were Orochi and Gyoro Gyoro, as well as anyone who called and was within the Monster Association. But did this change indicate that anyone who could overpower him became his new master, regardless of whether they were good or bad? Drive Knight seems to believe so. The fact that truly matters though is that Rover stood no chance against Saitama and he didn't even need to use much of his force to get his point across. Number 7. Evil Natural and Ocean Water This creature, also classified as a dragon level threat, was more akin to a natural disaster than a mysterious being like the others. Not only was it described as the most dangerous member of the Monster Association due to its uncontrollable nature and lack of speech, but it was kept in a tank and sealed away until a lower level monster set it free to attack the heroes during their raid. And just because this creature could not think the way that other beings can, did not stop it from reacting accordingly to threats on its life. As evil natural water, it could sense hostility and attack the source immediately to defend itself. Imagine if a thunderstorm could target specific people. That is similar to how this being functions. It sensed danger and aimed for that person or group and would not stop attacking until it was neutralized. Some of its abilities include absorption of other liquids such as sludge jellyfish, shape-shifting because it's made out of water so its form is very liquid, no pun intended, and its ability to sense hostility. Evil natural water had honed its instincts like a wild animal. Even Atomic Samurai's disciples, when they encountered it, treated it like a flood about to engulf them and had no choice but to flee to ensure their survival. Evil natural water also used the Mad Doctor Fish to attack them by throwing them like weapons. When this so-called mindless being came face to face with Child Emperor, who can outsmart most monsters, Evil Natural Water was able to think ahead enough to prevent itself from being frozen. That was when it absorbed Sludge Jellyfish and used the oils contained in the Sludge's body to keep itself intact. He even almost drowned Child Emperor with his liquid body until Tatsumaki came to the child's aid and freed him with her psychic powers. But not every S-Class hero is as fragile when facing Evil Natural Water. One such example is Super Alloy Darkshine, who was able to use his thick skin and massive muscles to block the monster gen attacks and save Yayan from being killed. On the flip side, when power types, not to the level of Saitama mind you, face this evil water creature, their punches or hits did nothing much except to push it back or stall its next move. On the surface, it later faced Garo who was constantly giving off an aggressive aura, so evil natural water wasted no time in shooting its jets at the hero hunter. Garo responded accordingly, deflecting and striking the liquid monster away, but in doing so helped it to evolve. With a body of water, literally, evil natural water became instead known as evil natural ocean, by merging with the ocean that just so happened to be nearby. This not only gave it more mass and destructive power, it made it much more difficult to disperse or strike as the characters had been doing so before. When its new name was revealed, its threat level also rose to unknown dangers, with the Hero Association having no way to classify such a world-ending disaster. After all, mankind is yet to truly conquer the ocean. At this power level, it was easily able to face Monsterize Garo with the help of Sage Centipede providing distractions, and its stronger jet attacks, now called Ocean Grand Cannon, could have destroyed a city and threatened to drown all the civilians living there had Z-City not been abandoned already. But did Evil Natural Ocean survive Saitama? The answer is a great big no. When Saitama arrived, running fast enough to be on top of the ocean, he simply unleashed his serious series, Serious Punch, and destroyed it with one powerful blow. Sure, it took Saitama using a named attack, but only one shot all the same. Water has a way of seeping through the cracks though, so maybe we shouldn't close this chapter just yet. Unfortunately for this water monster, it had a lot of weaknesses. Though it could do some thinking, it was more prone to instinctive actions and not worrying about consequences that could occur. Also, if the opponent it faced had no killing intent, 
then it wouldn't have a reason to fight, which is precisely what happened when it was meant to attack King and felt no threat. And its biggest weakness of all, it could not survive more than one punch from Saitama. Moving on. Number 6. Vomited Fuhrer Ugly Fear Ugly began as a dragon level monster, but it wasn't indicated whether after his evolution he became a higher threat level or not. Unsurprisingly, Fear Ugly also used to be a human, along with Homeless Emperor and Orochi. He was just an unattractive man who had so much inferiority and self-loathing and likely mistreatment due to his appearance that it caused him to transform into a mysterious being dubbed Ugmon. Drive Knight's data described Fyodor Ugly as being a resilient fighter who used physical and psychological attacks against his opponents to weaken both their mind and body through insult and violent attacks. He was also considered to be savage, which was certainly evident during his encounters with Sweet Mask. A detail that Drive Knight missed was the fact that Fyodor Ugly's abilities and endurance grew whenever he felt humiliated or upset about his own ugliness. And which hero had the pleasure of making his acquaintance first? None other than Sweet Mask, who prides himself on his outer beauty. This encounter demonstrates not only Sweet Mask's weakness to unattractiveness, but Ugly's ability at manipulating people's minds to his advantage. He startled Sweet Mask with a mirror effect, intensifying his ugliness to overwhelm the hero. He didn't even need to use his physical abilities, relying solely on his psychological attacks against the idle hero. Eventually, Sweet Mask was saved by Tatsumaki, who used her psychic powers to transport him away. That only helped for a short while, though. Once on the surface, Ugly wasted no time in continuing his battle with Sweet Mask. He smashed his face in with a point blank punch, flattening his skull as if a truck had hit him. Then, he ripped his body body in half by his legs, throwing him aside like a rag doll when he was done. At this point in the story, we had never seen anyone, let alone a high-ranking hero, be brutalized in such a gory way. And for it to be someone as strong and confident as Sweet Mask was shocking. Ugly continued his violent rampage by terrorizing Arinki's man, ripping his arm off. Tatsumaki used the little telekinetic power she had left to restrain Ugly, but Ugly began to morph and grow larger. With that, Fuhrer Ugly not only broke free from Tatsumaki's hold, but he also fought Tank Top Master, breaking his arm in multiple places. When he used his full body caving punch, a punch so violent and powerful, it left the S-Class hero's body destroyed and almost unrecognizable. But Fuhrer did not stop at one. No, 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 no. That wouldn't be vile enough. He did it three more times. If this isn't a vicious monster, I don't know what is. Against Bang, Fuhrer's fight was not so easy though. An accomplished martial artist knows how to counter strong opponents so long as they are not faster. And Fuhrer Ugly's punch that almost killed Tank Top Master was no use if it didn't hit Bang. In fact, it hit Fuhrer Ugly instead, further spurring his anger and aggression on. But Fuhrer Ugly had another attack up his sleeve. Dignity Caving Punch. Sadly, it was countered the same way his previous punch was and struck Gums instead. And if you're wondering why we didn't include Gums in the top 10, it is because he is mainly used as a stepping stone for Fuhrer Ugly's growth, as we are about to see. Bang bombarded Ugly with hits until he fell inside of Gums' mouth and stomach. Did this stop him? Not at all. Instead of allowing himself to be digested, Fear Ugly combined with Gum's digestive fluids, violently ripping out of Gum's body, and became vomited. Fear Ugly, an even deadlier monster. As if Ugly's viciousness was not enough, he now had the ability to melt his enemies with his newfound, uglier form. On his way to get revenge against Bang, Super Alloy Darkshine encountered this vile monster. He traumatized Darkshine by burning his fists and chest, proving that his muscles weren't as invincible as he thought. When the Sword Masters arrived, they stood no chance since the digestive acid vomited Fear Ugly used could melt even their weapons. The first to die was Zanbai, losing half of his face, followed by Amahade, who was protecting his students from the next attack. Master Nichiren was melted in half as well, but somehow survived even with his lower body missing. The brutality of these attacks were insane and certainly terrifying to witness. It almost seemed as if Vomited Fuhrer Ugly had no weaknesses, but he did. Because he was covered in stomach acid, more liquid than he was before, his body now required more maintenance to stay in one piece. By this I mean, any time he used an acid attack, it was consuming part of his body, and he had to find somewhere to replace what he just used. With no allies, even among his fellow monsters, Vomited Fuhrer Ugly stood no chance against the higher S-Class heroes, and especially not Saitama. He couldn't even melt Golden S, let alone Platinum S, nor avoid or deflect Homeless Emperor's Blast. With a single goal left, Vomited Ugly came across Bang intending to kill him but failed as he had managed to touch on one of Garo's soft spots. Vomited Fear Ugly died with a massive hole through his middle and no chance of predicting Garo's attack. Let's consider now how many characters could overtake Vomited Fear Ugly. His fellow monster leaders, Garo, probably Blast, and most certainly Saitama. He stood no chance at being at the top of this list. Number 5. Homeless Emperor 
Homeless Emperor was originally an office worker with no special abilities to speak of. But with the god creature noticing his suicidal plans, he was offered some power. An immense power at that. Now mind you, Japan is the country with the smallest rate of homelessness in the world, making up only 0.03% of the population. Begging is illegal, and generally speaking, a homeless person won't receive much sympathy from others, if at all, as to have been reduced to such a state is considered to solely be the fault of the derelict. It took him from the very bottom of Japanese society to being a super being. With Drive Knight describing his powers as light energy blasts, it would seem odd that he is classified above some beings who are still alive. But let's dive into why Homeless Emperor belongs at this spot. One of the first S-Class heroes Homeless Emperor encountered was Zombie Man arguably his worst matchup. Not because he lost, but because having no special body like the other mysterious beings put him at a disadvantage. He shot a seemingly endless barrage of attacks at Zombie Man, even blocking his bullet that was aimed at point blank range. But if Zombie Man ever got close enough, which he did, there wouldn't be much he could do that wouldn't have put his own body at risk. For the most part, their first battle was controlled by Homeless Emperor who didn't give Zombie Man enough time to regenerate himself. When the fight moved to the surface, Homeless Emperor did not hesitate to attack the S-Class heroes, Sweet Mask, Zombie Man and Child Emperor. This was where another of his talents came into play, his luck. As much as the other monsters have endless powers and ways to succeed in their battles, much of what helped Homeless Emperor was his luck. The next S-Class hero that Homeless Emperor had his sights on was Child Emperor, who was dragging Zombie Man. He targeted them with his light energy, not even warning his fellow monsters until the last moment. However, after trying to pursue Tatsumaki with numerous blasts and failing to hit her, he sat down and took a break. None of the other monsters were secure enough that they could simply sit on the sidelines and watch. Though he may not have had prior battle experience or instincts, he still knew when to get involved and who was safe to go after, minus Zombie Man. That led him to attack Atomic Samurai and his followers, holding nothing back as he used extreme carpet bombing to try and obliterate them all. Had Atomic Samurai landed his Sunblade attack on Homeless Emperor, this would have been the end of his section. However, his luck came in effect again. This time in the form of Golden S, who for some reason, decided to block the sword attack that was aimed at Homeless Emperor. Then with Evil Natural Water's return, Homeless Emperor regained his confidence and used it to focus instead on attacking King. He prepared a massive blast, overkill for how powerless King actually is. His luck this time dried up, and that's because nothing compares to the luck of King. When he accused King of hiding something, it blew back on him and caused him to panic about his weak body being revealed to the monsters. With all his stressing, he failed to notice Zombie Man's full recovery. Was Zombie Man the one to kill him? Not at all. In fact, I think he could have survived had Homeless Emperor just kept his mouth shut. Homeless Emperor had many weaknesses. He was overconfident, unwilling to cooperate with the Monster Association planning to turn on his teammates, he had only gained his power a month ago and seemed to solely depend on it, he was also lazy and over-reliant on others, even if he didn't trust them. But what caused his downfall in the end was his cowardice and blabber mouth. He was so worried about what Zombie Man would do to him that he told about his relationship to God, which instantly wiped him out of existence. Because it wasn't an S-Class hero, a fellow monster, Saitama, Tama or even Garo who took his life, it is hard to say how Homeless Emperor would have fared against them. One thing I can say for certain is that Homeless Emperor would have been too difficult for most S-Class heroes to fight, especially considering Tatsumaki was unconscious. The real issue is whether or not this god creature is on par with Saitama or not, and since that cannot be answered just yet, all we can go by is how quickly Zombie Man captured Homeless Emperor. Since an S-Class rank 8 hero took him down this easily by pretty much just grabbing hold of him, then I'd imagine a fierce blink from Saitama might just be too much for this guy to handle. Number 4. Platinum S – The Ultimate Fusion of the Black S Cells Another dragon level threat graces our list, this time in the form of a mob type monster. Not only did Platinum S first start out with large numbers of Black S cells, but it was able to separate and rejoin at will until reaching its final form. This creature is the epitome of strength in numbers, and it is clear why they were able to face so many high level opponents. If we start with what it can do in its base form, it is already very strong. As Black S, they fought numerous S-Class heroes and didn't struggle as much as you would expect. One of the S-Class heroes, Drive Knight, described Black S as proficient in combat. Even Psychos acknowledged Black S and his fighting capabilities, admitting that if the Cell Gang teamed up with Homeless Emperor, anyone would be a cinch for them. And Homeless Emperor, another high-ranking leader in the Monster Association, compared Black S, just a single cell of it, to an A-Class hero. Remember, this isn't even its final form. We are talking about the base form here. Black S, without considering his evolutions, already had strength, speed, regeneration, and cell division, the latter of which came in very handy to deal with physical attackers such as Super Alloy Darkshine. But let's talk about Black S's fight with Atomic Samurai first. For a monster that can divide itself as many times as needed, going up against a sword-wielding hero was the best case scenario for them. Every slash Atomic Samurai used against them, and the amount of slashes were many, only helped to divide Black S into more beings and more threats for the S-Class hero. 
And then, with only a fraction of its body recombined, Black S was able to drive Atomic Samurai back with a strong punch. Black S, in its base form, overwhelmed the hero with laughable ease. Had it not been for Tatsumaki's interruption, would Atomic Samurai have survived? Who can say? When the fight moved to the surface, Black S competed with his fellow Dragon level monsters on who could kill the most S class heroes. That challenge allowed Black S to reveal their strength by grabbing Sweet Mask and holding him tightly enough for Fear Ugly to attack. And later, against both Bang and Genos, with Genos taking most of the attack since he was carrying someone. This time, when faced with Atomic Samurai slashes, Black S was not divided, but sliced just enough to weaken. But even that attack allows himself to escape. And they were only stopped by Tatsumaki's psychic prowess and held in place. Darkshine thought that his strength was enough to stop Black S's numbers, but we know that when anyone looked down on the Cell mob, they only got stronger. There were so many cells divided that it required not only Bang, Atomic, and Darkshine's attention, but also the Council of the Swordsmasters and some lower level heroes to join in and fight them off. Not to mention a weakened Tatsumaki, who just spent most of her psychic powers fighting psychos. Even a single Black S was able to rip off Genesis' arm when they surrounded him. And once Vomited Fear or Ugly tries to consume their cells to replenish himself, the first transformation appeared. Golden S. This new form was not only immune to Vomited Fear or Ugly's digestive fluids, but it was a vastly stronger being. Golden S said that his body had anti-corrosive properties due to it being gold. And with this new and improved lusterous muscle body, Golden S even put Darkshine's power build to shame, as well as easily putting the hero down with his inferiority issues. Black S was still around too though, 10,000 of them having broken away to keep an eye on Ugly, and some more still over overwhelming Genos with their power, not to mention Tatsumaki, who was mostly unconscious at this point. Black S revealed that they still had over 449 billion cells available to fight with. Even as the Black S cells took on the S-Class heroes, Golden S was able to cover Homeless Emperor, who was nearly ended by Atomic Samurai. But even with all that power, Golden S remained cautious and encouraged the fellow monsters to combine their power to fight King. This showed a different kind of power survival instincts. Knowing when you're outmatched and need assistance helps to win a battle. They even refused to look away or aid Homeless Emperor when he was caught by Zombie Man to ensure they wouldn't be taken by surprise. That is when the ultimate form, Platinum S, was created to overcome the strongest man and his unknown power through the combination of 54 trillion cells with 100 escaping to ensure survival once again. Unfortunately, had they known the true strongest man was not even at the fight yet, maybe they consider a different plan of attack. In terms of appearance, Platinum S was smaller, but it simply meant the capacity of the cells were concentrated to a point that each attack held massively destructive power. And with one whip of the tentacle-esque antenna, Platinum S was able to attack Zombie Man, Atomic and his follower, put a put prisoner with Genos and Child Emperor already out of the fight, and set them aside so he could better face King. Even more impressive was Platinum S joining Flashy Flash and Garo's fight and landing attacks on both of them as he passed through. A high-speed, damage-heavy battle continued between the three, most of which took place in the air, creating a fascinating light show. On top of that, Platinum S's speed surpassed Flashy Flash, who was known for that skill. He even caught Flashy Flash's fist and pummeled him. But when faced with the monsterized Garo, Platinum S could not keep up with his speed nor strength. His body was blown into countless pieces when Garo rushed through him with his arms. Platinum S was no more, but perhaps a tiny Black S cell was still around. With that said, Platinum S and the smaller Black S had some weak weaknesses that led to their demise. Brute or blunt force such as the kind from Metal Bat could not be overcome, nor could Acid which was harder to avoid or divide against. When it became Platinum S, the cells could no longer split apart to avoid slashing attacks like they had previously with heroes like Atomic Samurai. Although Black S was pretty good at analyzing situations, they were also quick to anger and constantly wanted to prove their power. Platinum S was killed by Garo, who Saitama plays around with later on, so that means even Black S's ultimate form wouldn't be strong enough to survive any of his serious series moves. But let's move on to stronger and more complicated beings. Number 3. Orochi and Psychos These two beings are a special case and deserve to be ranked together. Not only did they eventually merge to create an even stronger monster, but Psychos is the one who created Orochi and his formidable strength in the first place. Also, the webcomic had no Orochi character, with only Psychos being the leader of the Monster Association, but that is another story. Although Orochi was the figurehead of the Association and Monster King, with Psychos instead playing the role of military advisor, the reality was that Psychos had more power within their association. She also used a false body named Gyoro Gyoro to hide her identity. But let's begin with Orochi who faced quite a few people, including Saitama. As the Monster King, the others feared him, and not just because they were fed to him when he needed nutrients to grow stronger. He was also their consequence should they run away from battles with the heroes. 
Rose. As for Orochi's fighting skills, Dried Knight indicated that he could manipulate horns to stab enemies, and he was the owner of monster cells. Even as a human, he was said to have some martial arts skills. Metal Knight, having lost his surveillance drone to one of Orochi's sharp horns, refused to join the raid out of fear. And so essentially, Orochi defeated an S-Class hero, and a high-ranking one at that, without even needing to confront him. Later, when Garo was launched through several floors and fell deeper underground, he reached the space where Gyoro Gyoro and Orochi were. It became clear how huge Orochi was when just one of his fingers was the size of Garo's entire body. He crushed him easily with his fist. After dropping Garo to the ground, one of Orochi's horns elongated and pierced Garo with Gar explaining that his horns were heavy, flexible, and extremely fast, also being the first ability that emerged for Orochi. Another of Orochi's talents was the illusion of a humanoid body, when most of his limbs and even his face was made up of monsterized parts, long and sharp with teeth, with his actual face much larger and more disturbing than the masked one he had on display. Similarly to Rover, Orochi could unleash a massive blast of heated energy from his mouth, destroying much of the monster association in the process. When Garo stood back and took a martial arts pose, Orochi followed suit with the same stance as the hero hunter. Orochi could copy movements just like Garo could, and with that, along with the serpent-like limbs growing from Orochi's body, Garo lost, was thrown, and therefore indented into the wall. Sensing a powerful foe in their association, Orochi went to meet them. It turned out to be Saitama himself. Though he planned to defeat Saitama and use him as a sacrifice to become a god, he failed. Their fight continued in the depths of the earth with overwhelming temperatures surrounding them that Orochi had no problem withstanding. Despite drawing energy from the earth's core itself, triggering volcanoes on the surface, and causing devastation to nearby buildings as well, Saitama only had to unleash his serious squirt gun to completely neutralize his massive of attack. With Orochi's, quite frankly, embarrassing loss to Saitama, it was now up to Saikos to demonstrate her power as the true leader of the Monster Association. Saikos, more human than Orochi, cleverly hid her true form deep underground and used Gyoro Gyoro as her puppet. After Saikos encountered Tatsumaki, her true body was easily discovered and her puppet's form was destroyed. She had been controlling the fake body from 1,500 meters underground, by the way. Aside from her psychic abilities and even gravity control to crush her enemies, Saikos was both callous and intelligent enough to discover that immense pain and torture, and even borderline death, could force evolution in humans to become ultimate monsters. Tatsumaki thought she had captured Psychos, but with an elixir in her possession, she was able to break free of Tatsumaki's hold on her. As part of Orochi's core survived, it sought to consume as much flesh as it could to regain its previous power. It then sent Psychos fighting Tatsumaki, aiming to absorb their bodies. Psychos and Orochi began to combine. They struggled for control of each other, with Orochi showing his true colors and thinking he had won over their merged bodies. But unleashing her monstrous psychic abilities, Psychos forced Orochi to obey. And Tatsumaki's own barrier had turned against her and been corrupted by this more powerful version of Psychos, threatening to crush the small Esper with every passing second. All the while, her form grew ever more hungry and larger, filling and destroying the monster association. Tatsumaki dragged Psychos' merged form from the depths of the underground, revealing her full body. It was now humanoid at the top with Psychos' face, but the body was larger and wide-ranging like a sea creature with claws and Orochi's previous elongated horns. Forming a triangle with her palms, Psychos unleashed one of the greatest psychic blasts we had ever seen towards Tatsumaki, covering a large swath of land and lifting it up. It was even visible from space. At this point, Psychos' form had to be beyond dragon level, just considering the scale of the attack. And as she revealed her deal with God that granted her even more power, it made sense for her abilities to get such a massive sudden boost. Now having Orochi's fire blast breathing heads as as well as her gravity power and telekinetic ability, she was almost unstoppable. Almost. As strong as Psychos was, she wasn't fast enough to prevent Tatsumaki from climbing inside of her body through her roots. Psychos had made the grave mistake of mentioning killing Fubuki next. Although badly wounded, Tatsumaki wrung Psychos with her abilities, and doing this to Psychos took so much power that Tatsumaki ended up coughing up blood. But Psychos was not completely done. She escaped in a flying vehicle. Though she momentarily got caught in Tatsumaki's barrier, it broke and she was free once more. If nothing else, Else, I can say that Psychos wasn't someone who gave up easily. As most of the S-Class heroes joined together to fight off who they thought was Psychos and Orochi's combined bodies, they were in actuality only ending the Monster King. In the end, Psychos escaped. Would she have been able to face Saitama considering the group of heroes who joined together to take her down? Well, without the powers God lent her, it seems unlikely. But since she is still alive and able to continue experimenting, and possibly creating monsters to merge with, there is still a chance we can see her face Saitama in the future. Number 2. Hero Hunter Garo One of the most prominent and complex characters in One Punch Man is Garo. He started off as a simple martial artist seeking for more strength and challenges, and branched off down a dark path that led him to face death countless times. It all started innocently enough. Garo wanted to see if he could win in a real fight against his fellow dojo members, and ended up beating them all badly. 
But let's get into Garo the monster. As stated with the beginning of this video, he is classified by the Hero Association as Kaijin, which if you notice is not the same as Kaiju used for monsters. It means roughly the same thing except Jin refers to people or mutants. Super villain could also be a good translation for the term. Without any special monster cells or abilities, Garo is able to improve in every fight he experiences. Not only that, but he is able to copy and reproduce the attacks used against him once he understands them. Being a martial artist, he has enhanced speed, strength, agility, and fighting intuition. But the more he fights, the more resilience he builds up as well. Not to mention, he studied his future opponents thanks to Tadeo's handbook. At the beginning of his transformation, Garo is classified as a dragon level threat, but this is likely much higher considering how much more he improves later on. Additionally, Garo needs to consume meat or flesh after each hard battle to replenish the nutrients and blood, and even eats a monster he kills when he doesn't have animal meat around. But let's get into Garo's many, many feats. His first appearance with monstrous intentions had him defeating an entire room of unsavory people, as well as blue fire removing his arm, magic man, heavy tank loincloth, and announcing his existence to the Hero Association. Those are all A-class heroes. Later, he beat up Tank Top Master and Moomin Rider at the same time, along with all of Tank Top's crew, as well as Charanko, but let's not pretend he is a strong fighter. Not long after, he hunts Golden Ball and Spring Mustachio, two A-rank heroes, and easily defeats them. Then he randomly encounters Metal Bat and deflects even his strongest attacks when he is pumped up, but underestimates him and almost gets attacked from behind. The only thing that helped him was Metal Bat's sister, Zen interrupting the fight. Feeling unsatisfied with that fight, Garo finds himself in Watchdog Man's territory, but barely escapes with his life. He does, however, incorporate the moves he saw during that fight later on. In the forest, Garo faces Death Gatling, Stinger, Chain and Toad, Smile Man, Gun Gun, Shooter, Glasses, Wild Horn, and wins, even though he gets badly injured in the process. And then he even went up against Genos, who has had significant upgrades by Dr. Crescendo. After one Bang and Bomb arrive, it is clear he is no longer fit to keep fighting with all the damage he's accumulated. Phoenix Man interrupts the fight, but Garo was already evolving on his own and unleashing a monstrous amount of strength. Perhaps he could have continued the fight after all at the cost of his humanity. And I choose to consider this a feat, but Garo came across Saitama on multiple separate occasions and received an attack with no chance to block and survived each time with a bit of memory loss afterwards, but still. When he is taken to the Monster Association to be recruited, he plays along but has no plans to truly cooperate with the conglomerate and gets ambushed by Ripper the King and Bug God who had followed him. Though he's left for dead, he survives with his extensive damage and grows stronger again. Amidst his monsterization, Garo successfully gets revenge for Ripper's previous attack and kills him with destructive power. He later takes a direct blast from Overgrown Rover, who he sensed would be a strong opponent that he should avoid fighting. His instincts warn him to just back away, but he ended up having to fight and managed to escape with his life. He next has to confront Orochi, and despite being overwhelmed by his size alone, he refused to back down until he eventually was knocked out. These may both be losses, but the fact that Garo can keep surviving these brutal fights is almost miraculous. Later, he is found by Puri Puri Prisoner, who thought he was an innocent captive. While still unconscious, Garo fights Prisoner as his monsterization gets more and more advanced and bombards him with attacks. Darkshine shows up soon after to provide backup, and he overwhelms the S-Class hero to the point of feeling like a bully. In full monsterization back on the surface, Garo gets his rematch with Bang and Bomb, and this time, beats them both with a combination of styles he had gained up to this point. Then when he is confronted by Flashy Flash, he surpasses his speed and easily avoids the hero's attacks. And once Flashy Flash is knocked down by Platinum S, Garo is able to focus on the creature and kills him by diving through his body with his bare hands. Notice that he never wants to kill heroes though. He also joins forces with Metal Bat to take down Sage Centipede, the biggest centipede monster we have encountered yet. For the most part, he only wanted to protect Tadeo, who was in the helicopter nearby, but that's besides the point. Not only did Garo throw the monster's core into space, but then he took that distraction to chop him completely in half straight down the middle. Garo became stronger by way of a resonance between himself and Metal Bat, and also managed to perfect his martial arts. After doing so, Garo is soon met by Saitama himself. Initially, Garo had no comprehension whatsoever in regards to Saitama's capabilities, and largely dismissed him. However, the pressure to be felt from the hero's admittance of frustration was enough for him to recoil in fear, despite only just believing there to be nothing left for him to fear in the world. Once he stabilized himself mentally, he decided to break Saitama's spirit by attacking him. However, without even trying, Saitama instinctively knocked Garo aside like he had before, hitting Garo so hard that it brought his memory of Saitama back to the forefront of his mind. Now properly recognizing him to be the final hurdle along his path of becoming the ultimate evil, Garo sought to assail Saitama countless times and for a while struggled to land a hit. However, before long, he was able to begin evading Saitama's fists as well and began landing his hit. However, simply hitting Saitama was far from being enough, as in landing a chop onto the guy's cranium 
Stadium with his so-called pinnacle of martial arts. Garo's entire hand shattered once Saitama provided any degree of resistance. At this level, Garo was simply a pest to Saitama that only provided frustration in the sense that he wouldn't listen. However, despite being hit by Saitama, Garo was able to withstand several of those attacks, the likes of which had one-shot several dragon level threats in the past. For the sake of catching up to his opponent, Garo began to further monsterize, becoming far more bestial and looming in stature. Yet even with this newfound strength that was said to be overflowing, a direct punch with all his might onto Saitama's face did not even manage to leave a mark. Saitama could easily swat Garo's new form away, controlling the direction of the brawl. But in their continuation, Garo came to recognize that despite his overwhelming power, Saitama was an absolute amateur when it came to martial arts. And so, by way of his own ever-refined technique, Garo began to steal the momentum by countering each of Saitama's attempts to hit him. Saitama had a crazy amount of openings to be capitalized on, but again, that doesn't really matter when you're built like Saitama. Not to mention, he was outpacing Garo simply by way of his unreal reflexes and reaction speed. Garo continued to pull out all the stops against the guy, but again and again, they meant nothing against Saitama, who at this point was downright trolling the guy. In his frustration, Garo's evolution would see even greater heights, literally, as he not only sized up, but also sprouted wings. An astonishing amplification of his own strength that Saitama complimented, as from his perspective, Garo had gotten a little better again. Garo would continue to give the fight all that he had, but it simply was not enough to truly impact Saitama. Garo, deep down, is a good guy, and because of that, he has many weaknesses as a monster. From what we are shown, Tadeo, who was bullied similarly to how he was, is his biggest downfall. He saves the kid from monsters like Royal Ripper, and long before that, Garo protected Tadeo when the heroes had noticed him in the shed. Also, when Sludge Jellyfish wanted to abduct Zenko and Garo overheard him, he purposely, or inadvertently, protected her from that kidnapping by letting the monster know that he was aware of being followed. But one of his most interesting weaknesses is Bang, who he still sees as his master even though he has far surpassed him. Following his heart, broke him out of his monsterization to save Bang from being melted by Bombarded Fear or Ugly. And then, it was just a chain reaction of him killing all the other monsters. Why isn't Garo number one, you ask? Well, as Garo's form morphs further to try and overcome Saitama's strength, there is still a turmoil within him because of Tadeo. Tadeo sees him as the best hero ever for saving him so many times and deeply relies on him. This could cause just about anyone to doubt their beliefs and want to rethink their actions, even if only deep down. Saitama in his fight against Garo is holding back to a degree because he does not recognize Garo to actually be a bad person and promised Tadeo that he would stop him, not kill him. Do you agree with our ranking so far? Let us know your own ranking in the comments. Now for some honorable mentions. Mad Cyborg with his unknown identity and powers destroyed Genesis Village and Dr. Kusheno and Drive Knight are also victims of his terror. He is believed to have been created by Dr. Bofoy, aka Metal Knight, which is why Drive Knight probably gave Genos that warning. Phoenix Man, who had resurrection abilities, not just for himself, but for his ninja teammates and had them brainwashed into fighting for him, also gets a quick mention. Phoenix Man was pretty tough, but since he went up against a technology user and not a power type like Saitama or Blast, I think he would have lost easily against them and cannot compare to people like Garo or even Overgrown Rover. The Mysterious God is next because it can lend out its immense power through deals and suck the life out of those who have its power when it deems necessary. But we know next to nothing about it besides the fact that it is trying to be resurrected by a worthy sacrifice and Blast is hot in its trail. Vito Sound Sonic deserves to be mentioned because anyone who survives an accidental poke to their crotch by Saitama is a monster in their own right. He uses Tenfold Funeral against Saitama and survives Saitama's responding move of serious sideways jumps. But who is the true strongest monster? A mosquito! Maybe it'll turn out that this specific mosquito was a mysterious being and that was why someone as fast and as strong as Saitama couldn't kill it. Who knows? Just kidding. Now for the real top monster of One Punch Man so far. Number 1. Leader of the Dark Matter Thieves, Dominator of the Universe, Boros. This alien entity's threat level was not disclosed as only Saitama confronted him and killed him before he could be acknowledged by the Hero Association. Upon arrival in his enormous ship, Boros destroyed a city just from landing and sending warriors out to fight. Boros was from a strong race, which kind of reminds me of the Saiyans, and was an alien rather than a monster from Earth or a being like God. Interestingly, Boros faced the same existential crisis as Saitama because he was too strong and was willing to travel almost 20 years to finally find an opponent that would give him a proper challenge. Now, if that isn't dedication, then I don't know what is. Boros gained his strength and resilience from the environment of his harsh planet and was also considered the strongest being there. He had regenerative abilities, consequently self-healing, as well as enhanced physical strength and latent energy. Plus, he had a pretty cool design. When he faced Saitama, Boros was even able to last more than a few minutes unlike the rest of the monsters up against Saitama on this list. The first hit he received, an unnamed punch when Saitama underestimated him did no damage besides destroying his armor. This armor had also been keeping his power in check. Saitama even said, 
you're pretty strong. Which he barely ever says, but he still looked unfazed by his opponent. Boros didn't waste a moment before letting off his meteoric burst, which destroyed part of his own ship. And that was followed by a flurry of attacks on Saitama, including a knee to his middle that sent Saitama to the moon. Unfortunately, Boros admitted that using meteoric burst shortened his lifespan because of how much of a toll it took on his body. This meant that if he needed to continue using it, which he did, he was bringing himself closer to death just to prove that he was the strongest in the universe. When Saitama returned from the moon, Boros receives a direct punch to the gut, heavily injuring him but still clinging to survival with his resilience. Next, Saitama started to pull out the bigger guns, consecutive normal punches. A titled move, but only borderline using Saitama's real strength, completely decimated Boros, but the alien was able to regenerate just as quickly by pulling all his parts back together like a magnet, despite now very clearly being injured. Boros used another impossibly powerful move called Collapsing Star Roaring Cannon to at least try and injure Saitama. He said it not only used all his energy, but could destroy the entire planet. With that in mind, Saitama decides to answer Boros with an ultimate move of his own. Serious series, serious punch. And even after taking that massive blast of force, Boros did not die right away, proving his history of fighting and travel were not lies. In his final moments depleted of life and energy, 